I'll be reading from the 11 verses from the text for our sermon today from 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God our Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be to yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. An inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of these things which have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. I was upstairs one day, and I heard a scream. I mean, a loud scream, and I knew who it was. It was my wife, Tiffany's scream. And so I, you know, came running down the stairs, and I said, what is it, what is it, what is it? And she said, it's a snake. Okay, where is the snake? It's outside the front door. Okay, all right, so I have to go check this out. I don't like snakes. I hate them, okay? I hate them, but I'm the husband, so I've got to do something here. So, uh, so I go and check, and I was like, maybe she's just seeing things. And so I, I look out the door, and we were living in a townhome at the time. And so there, our neighbor's door is right next to our door. And so I uh, went into the garage, and I walked through the garage because I wasn't about to go out the door. Okay, not if there is a snake out there. So um, I, go, I go out uh, into the garage around to where the walkway is into, uh, into our front doorway, and I look around the corner, and sure enough, there's a snake curled up above our neighbor's door. Okay, and so now I have to, uh, well, it's not above our door, you know, started going through the things. How much do I really love our neighbor? Uh, you know, so... Um, <laughs> I decide I have to do something, okay, because if she opens the door, game over, right? And I don't even know what kind of snake it is. And so I go back into my garage, and I grab a nine iron. <laughs> and I'm going to handle this snake, I guess. And so I come around, back around. The garage is long. There's a sidewalk all the way in. The, the, the doors are kind of alongside the, the, the wall to the garage. And so, so we're, uh, I'm walking towards it now. I'm probably about, I don't know, 20 feet away, and I see it. And I'm walking towards it. I have this nine iron, and I'm ready to figure out what to do. Some, you know, how, I don't even know what I'm going to do. So I'm walking closer, and then all of a sudden, stop! It's my wife yelling at me, what? Snakes jump 15 feet. <laughs> I don't think they jump that far. No, they do. Okay, well, I still got to go. Do, are we going to leave it here? No? Okay, so I keep walking. Take another couple of steps. Stop! What? They really do jump that far. And, and I, I've, I've got to go get this. So I take another couple of steps. 
You should just call somebody, Tim. No, I got this. I take another step, another step. I get closer. You know, I'm getting closer. I start to think, maybe she's right. (laughs) I don't even know what kind of snake this is. It could be venomous or something like that. So uh, I decide to retreat, to go to my phone, to call whoever deals with these sorts of things, which happened to be the police department. So, I mean, within 15 minutes, a police cruiser rolls up and out pops out the scariest looking police officer you'll ever meet. I mean, he's all business. He's like, he's, re- he's almost excited to deal with this today, you know? And so he pops open the trunk and I'm like, what has he got in there? He pulls out something that grabs things. I was like, wow, he must do this a lot. And so, so he's coming up and he's talking with me and I'm just giving him the update. I'm saying, yeah, there's a snake above the door and uh, we're getting closer, and he looks up, he's like, oh, sure enough, there is, and so we're getting closer to the snake, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very confident now, you know, I'm like a step behind him, this, and so, so, so there he is going towards it, and he's asking me more questions, and he says, so, so have you seen it move at all? I said, well, I mean, maybe a little, I mean, I got, you know, about where we are right now, so he kept going closer, and he said, so you haven't seen it move? I said, no, and so then he just, like, hits turbo speed, goes up to it, and flicks the head of a rubber snake, that was taped above my neighbor's door because birds had been nesting. And for the rest of the day, the the boys and gals at the police department had a good laugh at, at my expense. It wasn't real. It wasn't a real snake. How do you tell if something is real? Like it's genuinely real. The only way is you have to get up close. You have to, you have to inspect it. You have to find some evidence to prove that it's actually what you're seeing. Because we can be fooled from a distance. Things can look real from a distance, but it's really not genuine. So in this new series, we're calling it Genuine Faith. And so we're going to be going through the book, the letter, really, of 1 Peter. And we're going to be unpacking this question. Is your faith genuine? Like if we were to get up close to your life, if we were to pull up a a chair at your dinner table... If I were to, you know, look over your shoulder while you're scrolling on your phone, if I were to watch you as you spend every purchase, if I were to listen to you as you talk, would I conclude that you have genuine faith? Would it be real? Will we see, based upon your desires and your words, will it it be a faith that is real and ready for anything, because as, as Peter has already said in the verses we just read in verse 7, we're going to face all kinds of tests, all kinds of trials. And he's essentially saying these have come so that your faith might be proven real and genuine. And maybe you're here today, and your faith, well, your faith has questions. And if you got the answers to those questions, then maybe it would be more real. Maybe you're here today and you're figuring out faith. You're not sure where to put your faith. You're exploring faith. Maybe you're here today and your faith is fading. You've been faithful for years, but something is is nagging at your faith and it's just a little shaky right now. And maybe for some of you, you feel like you're on solid ground. Your faith couldn't be stronger. Now, Peter was a follower of Jesus. He was a Jewish fisherman that Jesus called to follow him. And then he witnessed the resurrection, the life of Jesus. And he eventually gains the title apostle as he signs this letter. An apostle basically is a sent one. So he was sent by Jesus with authority to teach the world that salvation is only found through faith genuine faith 
in Jesus. And so he eventually, after he works his way through Jerusalem and providing leadership there, he eventually works his way through what we would call modern-day Turkey. And he's uh, seems like he's visited some of these places because he shares some of these names. This is the audience he's, he's written to. But as he's writing this letter of 1 Peter, he's in Rome. That's where he's at, and that's where he will die. It's about 62 to 64 AD, and eventually Peter dies of the legend is upside down crucifixion because we are in a scene right now where Christianity is spreading. It's spreading because of previous generations, there was something called the diaspora, which essentially Jews who had been conquered and persecuted for many, many centuries uh, had continued to be conquered over and over and over by different nations. And then they kind of had to spread out. They spread out all over kind of the known uh, world at that time. And what that did, interestingly enough, was create this scenario for the gospel to spread. And so Peter and Paul and other people like him are going to all of these places where, where Jews have scattered because of they've been conquered and they're preaching the gospel and people are coming to faith. Now, as Peter's writing this letter, I want you to understand that this isn't just a letter, Okay. This aren't Peter's suggestions. These are words that are spirit-led, that are authoritative. They're not just good ideas. The reason why 1 Peter and other letters are included in, in the New Testament is because they pass three tests. The origin test. So in other words, if something's in your New Testament, it's because somebody clo in close proximity to an apostle of Jesus wrote it. It passed the recognition test. In other words, all the churches recognized that they wrote it and it was from them. And it passed the consistency test. In other words, it wasn't some wild content that didn't match all the other content of the Bible. And so when Peter's writing, he's writing authoritative spirit-led words. These are not, this isn't just a letter. This is Bible. This is, this is what God wants these people to hear. Who is he writing to? He's writing, well, they get two names they're called God's elect in the first two verses of this letter. And they're also called exiles. What does that mean? Well, that means they are God's elect. That means they are citizens of, of heaven, that they have all the, the, the things that come with that. You know, they're chosen people. But at the same time, they're exiles, which means that they're aliens. They don't have a home. What we learn about the audience of 1 Peter is that they were essentially second-class citizens, which you and I have a tough time relating to. What do I mean? Well, they didn't have the same rights as Roman citizens or even natives of those areas. They constantly faced suspicion and persecution. They couldn't even buy land a lot of time. And Nero, the emperor of Rome, is about to begin one of the heaviest waves of persecution throughout the Roman Empire. So maintaining a real faith, a genuine faith, only added to their struggles. And so Peter's writing because he wants to encourage them as they're facing real trials, real struggles. How do we live with genuine faith in these difficult circumstances? What is genuine faith? And how do you know if you have it? But well, we're going to look at three proofs today. Three things that will prove, that will test if you have genuine faith. Genuine faith, as we're going to see, believes, receives, and perceives. The first thing, genuine faith believes in a reliable object. So all faith has to be on something. You trust on something. It has to have an object. So faith Genuine faith believes in a reliable object, and it's observable. It's observable. So in this text that we read, faith was used four times. In the Greek, the word for faith can be translated as faith, believe, or trust. All the same word. Very important. Now, there are two components in biblical belief, okay? The first one is trust placed in the right place, in a genuine object. Because trust placed in the wrong place 
is not genuine faith. Here's what I mean. You, you can have real belief, like you're, you're, you trust it so much, but it could be in the wrong thing. It could be not genuine. You could believe so vehemently that the earth is flat. And I'm here to tell you, it is not flat, okay? You can have all this faith in the wrong thing. Or look at the Civil War, for example. There was a whole bunch of people in our country that believed vehemently in preserving slavery and racism. Very passionate about it. But it was faith in the wrong thing. So faith has to, has to be placed in the right place, in a genuine object, not a wrong object or an incorrect object. And then the second component of biblical belief is true beliefs are reflected in behavior. So in other words, it has an object, and if you really trust in something, it's observable. It's observable. It ha there has to be some sort of observable proof or evidence that your actions align with, with the claims of, of faith that you say you have. So let me give you an example. So like if you really trust in something, like maybe you're an, inv an investor. That's what you do for a living. You invest. And you get a tip that a certain stock is going to 100x, and you really believe this. If you have faith in this, what do you do? Well, you invest everything, right? You invest a lot. Or let's say you're dating someone and you're in love with them. You know, you want to spend the rest of your life with them. They're the only one for you. You know, there's nobody else. You really believe they love you back. So what do you do if you really believe that? Well, you, you buy a ring and you propose and you get married and, and you live out what you believe. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 the heading in my Bible when I was reading this, the chapter heading said faith in action, and I crossed it out. <laughs> I can cross out things that are not Bible verses. That's okay. It was just a heading summarizing what was about to come. And I, and I wrote instead, I wrote faith equals action. Because here's what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So the investor can't see the future, but he acts with faith because the evidence is trustworthy and compelling. So he invests everything he has because he really believes the stock is going to go 100x. Or, you know, you really can't see inside another person, but based on how they act, based on how they treat you, based on how they laugh at your jokes that aren't really that funny, it's compelling evidence that they really love you back. And so it gives you the confidence to then say, will you marry me? Real faith must be in the right place. A genuine object that's trustworthy. And true beliefs are always proved by behavior. It must be observable. Now verse 3 of Hebrews 11 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Under, the word understand, we can almost substitute that for see. Like we can, we can see. By faith we see that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We can't see God right now. But, but the evidence for him creating is so compelling in part because the best scientific explanation of the origins of the universe is this. Well, there was an accidental, random explosion of non-material matter that sparked life and history with precision and beauty. So it's kind of like this. Imagine a room uh, where there's all these uh, you know, paint supplies. There's an easel, there's something to paint on, there's, there's, there's paint brushes and paint. And, and just, just imagine, um, you know, this room that all these things are there and then suddenly they bumped into one another and poof, the Mona Lisa. Or poof, the Sistine Chapel. I mean, when you look at creation, what do you understand? Accident? or artist. 
mystery or masterpiece. Now, if we were to keep reading Hebrews 11, we would see this phrase, by faith, is used 20 times. And every time it's said, there's a verb that's followed by it. If you don't remember what a verb is, that means that's an action, okay? So let me just cover a few real quick. By faith, Abel brought. Noah built. Abraham obeyed, went, made, lived. There's some other verbs that we find. By faith, they considered. By faith, longing. By, by faith, offered. By faith, reasoned. By faith, blessed. By faith, spoke. By faith, hid. By faith, saw. By faith, passed through. through best, blah, blah, by faith, chose mistreatment versus enjoyment. By faith, marched. By faith, welcome. Then we could go on and on and on and on and on. But what I want to point out to you is how do you know if you have genuine faith? Genuine faith is understanding who God really is, that he's a faithful object to place your trust in, and then observably trusting in him. Is your faith placed in a reliable object? And then, is there proving observable behavior that we can see? Caution. Some people look the part, but in the heart, it's not genuine. Number two, and second proof, a genuine faith receives a new identity based on mercy. Now, one of our deepest needs is a true identity. We need to be able to answer the question, who am I really? And often we do this, and we're encouraged to do this, by creating our own identity. And we're told, hey, hey, just, just you know, pursue who you really are, um, you know, find your purpose, find what gives you fulfillment, and then once you find it, that's who you are. And then what you need to do is now maintain it and then affirm it, whatever you choose your identity to be. And so, 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 so why do we do this? Well, because we think that by being our truest self, it will unlock our happiest self and our highest sense of fulfillment in life. And in part, that's true. But when we're creating an identity, while there's this craze to create an identity right now, and all of us, what we're actually doing, and, and many people don't realize this, we're actually looking for something to shield us. In verse 5 of 1 Peter 1, we learn that faith shield is a shield for us. And this is what an identity does. It provides security. It, it gives us meaning. It helps us feel good when we're anxious. You know, when, when something bad is happening or when we're suffering or, or we're going through something hard, even though that is happening, I know who I am. And I just need to be true to myself. It's how we face struggles in life. It's a shield. Now, Tim Keller tells a fascinating story of a woman that he met who uh, told him, I have had five identities in my lifetime. And she started to explain this. She said, hey, when I was young, I grew up, uh, you know, trying to be very moral. I grew up in a very conservative church. And I felt good and secure, shielded, because I was, you know, one of the good people, not one of those other people. And then over time, what happened was I started becoming uh, a little self-righteous. And it began to bother me. And so I, I wasn't finding fulfillment in that anymore because I wasn't even able to live up to my own standards. And so then she said she decided to pursue relationships and dating and romance. And then she said her, her new identity was, was now she felt good about herself because somebody loved her. And so that brought her meaning and purpose. Now there was a, a song by uh, Frank Sinatra back in the 40s and it, the name of the song is, You're Nobody Till Somebody Loves You. And so, so for her, and sometimes for us, her security, her identity, her meaning, well, she had it. It was intact as long as she had a guy on her arm who really thought she was someone, who really thought she was lovable. 
in something. She knew she was okay when somebody loved her and affirmed her, comforted her. And eventually that kind of mindset proved to be bad because it led to her staying in unhealthy situations, abusive situations, sinful situations, because her whole meaning, her whole grounding for her identity was based in a relationship. And the thought of not being in a relationship was worse than experiencing what was going on in the relationship. And so eventually someone came along and told her, oh, honey, you, you don't need to ground your identity on men. What you need is a career. What you need is to, to be, a, you know, be liberated from that and, and be an individual you know, career woman. And so uh, she started pursuing education and got a career. And then she said, I started feeling good about myself because now I'm a successful career woman. But as a career woman... She then realized that every time her career hit a bump or there was a struggle at work or she didn't hit a goal or didn't make an accomplishment, it, she was just as destroyed as when she faced hardships and relationships. And then someone came along, oh, you're doing it all wrong. What you need to be is not so much building a life for yourself. You need to be helping other people. That's what it's all about. And so, so, so she started to help others. She started helping and serving and volunteering with poor and even in the prisons and then she became exhausted and found out that didn't work either. And here's what the quote where she told Pastor Tim Keller. She said, first I thought I was somebody because I was moral. Then I thought I was somebody because I was beautiful. Then I thought I was somebody because I was successful. Then I thought I was somebody because I was helpful. Then she heard the gospel and realized that her whole life she had been trying to create her own identity her own grounding to secure her, to shield her, to put her faith in. And then she gave herself to Christ. And she said, now I know God loves me because of what Jesus has done, not because of what I have done. See, every other identity that we try is based on our own performance. And it comes with all kinds of pressures and they don't work. They don't shield us. They don't bring us security. It's almost like we try on identities like outfits to see if they will actually work, to see if they will fill the hole in our heart, to see if they will make us feel, feel better, to see if they will explain us. And then when they don't work, we try something different. We date someone new. We adapt our views. We insert whatever excuse makes sense. Or we just try harder. What are we doing in our obsession with an identity? It is we are creating a shield. We need something to give us security as we go through human life. Now, verse 3 through 5 in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, Peter writes about an identity that can actually shield us. Let me read it to you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It will always work. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You only have an inheritance if you have an identity. Who through faith, that's how you get it. You receive a new identity through faith. You are shielded, not by your power, not by your ability, not by your good looks, not by if somebody loves you, not by if you're super successful, not by if you get all these great grades. You're shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. There's two reasons why creating an identity for yourself doesn't work. The first one is your sense of self will always depend on your ability to be faithful yourself to that very identity you create. You have to live up to it. You can never fall out of alignment with it or, or you'll start to feel insecure. The second reason is because your greatest need isn't finding your true self. What is it? It's receiving mercy. That's your greatest need. So even if you are able to create your own identity, 
you will still inevitably be unfaithful. So if you say, my deepest meaning or, or my security or my truest self, my truest identity, well, it's found in my gender. It's found in being a man or a woman. The moment you fail under the conditions laid out by culture or your own construct of gender, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to feel like a failure. Or let's say maybe your identity is wrapped up in being a good parent, like a good father or a good mother. Like you feel the best about yourself when you're really being a good mom or you're really being a good dad. See, the moment you fall short of what you think a good mom or a good dad is, you will feel like a failure. Or maybe you think, oh, no, as long as I'm a good person, that's my identity. That's what's going to get me into the future. That's what's going to gain me the inheritance. And what's a good person? Well, that's someone who is tolerant, you know. I'm a really tolerant person. Well, the moment you're not tolerant, the moment you're not tolerant to someone who is different or disagrees with you, you are now being unfaithful to your truest ideals. You've built an identity on your own. And when you're unfaithful to yourself and this self that you have constructed and built your whole life on, your living hope on it, who or where will you turn to for mercy? Who is going to give you mercy? Are you going to give mercy to yourself? If it's not God, then what is it? Listen, your greatest need isn't finding your true self. It's receiving mercy. Because in receiving mercy, you will find who you truly are. When your identity is is based on trusting yourself as the object, you're going to let yourself down. You're not a genuine object that's perfectly faithful and trustworthy. But when you do your identity like that, what shields you all the time isn't your faith, it's how you feel about how you're doing. The only identity that is secure, is based on the faithfulness of God, the character of God to give us mercy. Notice in verse 3, it says, but the God, the God, the God, not a God, not the universe, not whichever God you pick, no, the God as revealed in the Bible. That's the God who gives mercy. And we have broken the moral laws that he, is, that, he, that he embodies. And mercy is what he wants to give us. Mercy is choosing not to administer deserved justice. And you and I don't just need some mercy. No, just like Peter says, you need great mercy. We haven't just done a little injustice. You need great mercy because you have great sin. All of us have been unfaithful to the God. And you cannot understand who you are unless you understand that idea. Why? Let me, let me just say this to you. See, the more you see your need for mercy because of sin, the greater you see how much God loves you and the full cost of his sacrifice for you. The higher the price God had to pay means the higher the worth of the person he paid for. What is going to give you the most secure identity? It's, it's the perfect God who has paid the highest price. He alone can set your worth based upon his great mercy. You don't have human worth without the great mercy of a holy God. The identity interpreted from being the object of God's mercy is the most fulfilling and shielding and securing identity. New birth is new identity. You see, when you know who you are because of what God has done, that's what salvation is. It's a powerful regeneration of your heart, powerful enough to make your spirit come to life and to one day raise your body from the dead. How do you know if you have genuine faith? when who you are is no longer carried by your ability to be faithful, to fulfill some sort of chosen identity. It's not based in how good you are and your reliability to measure up to it. 
It's not based in your work performance. It's not based on whether or not boys like you and pay attention to you. It's not based on your physical appearance. It's not based on approval from any other human person. It's only based and only secure and only firm ground if it's based in his faithfulness, God's faithfulness and his constant reliability to be true to who he is and he shields you. When he is your shield, when you know your deepest need is to receive great mercy. And when you receive that great mercy, you receive this new identity from a holy, loving, faithful God who loves you, who knows you, who wants you, knows everything about you, and still gave up everything just to have you. That's the only identity that will last. The third proof I want to look at, so we've already said that genuine faith believes, genuine faith receives, and genuine faith perceives God has purpose in my problems. You see, it's impossible to have new birth that results from genuine faith and not have disruption. It's impossible to have a new identity and not new activity. It's impossible to be a part of God's family and not look like you're a part of God's family. You're going to have disruption if you've received the new birth that comes from genuine faith. Everything you do is filtered through who you are in Christ. How you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you treat people, the choices that you make, and how you see things. All of that has to be filtered through who you are in Christ. I mean, are you still the kind of person who, you know, calls into work with a lie just to do something different? You can't be that kind of person anymore because you have received mercy. You're new. Are are you still the kind of person that loses their handle on their temper? You, You can't be that kind of person because of who you are in Christ. When we're reacting in tempers, usually it's because something's threatened and that's a lot of times what we're basing our sense of peace or comfort or identity in. God's salvation is a new birth. That's what Peter's telling this audience. He's saying, hey, I realize you're second-class citizens, and that's no fun, but now you're God's elect. You have a new identity. What that means is he wants to grow us up into someone. Salvation isn't just go to heaven when you die. It's the beginning of a process that calls you his own and then makes you his own over time. What does God use to grow us up? To sanctify us. Problems. God has a purpose in your problems. Someone with genuine faith perceives that God has a purpose in their problems. Let me read James chapter 1. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. How many of you know your greatest growth comes through your greatest struggles? You're probably in some kind of test right now something that's testing and trying your faith, something that's nagging at you, something in the back of your heart that you're, you're just feeling a certain way about. Why is that there? Why are you going through that? God is going to use it to grow you up. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, because you know he has a purpose in your problems. You don't have to like the way it feels, but you know the result In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Your faith. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So when our faith is being tested, 
And if you have received new birth and you believe in great mercy and the faithfulness of God, the way you perceive the problems, well, it has to change. Now, there's two questions on the test anytime your, your faith is being tested, whether or not it's genuine. Here's the first question. Do you prefer comfort or character? Which one is it? Let me just run through all the decisions you made over the weekend. For Peter's audience, which we cannot relate to because they were really suffering all kinds of trials. What that means is they couldn't buy land. They were denied rights. There was constant suspicion. They were like segregated people. Like to really be Christian provided no material benefit for them. It was like an incredible sacrifice. And they could have been tempted in those trials and those tests to think, hey, God, could you, could you make living out my Christianity a little more comfortable? I think that would be good for me. You know, can you do something about, you know, changing the laws so we can own land like everybody else? That would really help us grow. If we could just have this one thing. See, you'll, you'll never understand why God allows pain if you don't understand that he's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. He's interested in giving you an inheritance that will never spoil or fade. Not something to base your life on that will, fall, that will not deliver. Rick Warren says, a sign of a growing faith is less comfort me prayers and more conform me prayers. He also writes in his book, A Purpose Driven Life, a silversmith was asked, how do you know when the silver is pure? He replied, when I see my own reflection in it. When you've been refined by trials, people can see Jesus' reflection in you. And I want to remind you, that's God's number one objective in your life, is to create the character of Christ, not to give you the comforts you desire. And you say, God knows and has all wisdom. How is he using this marriage problem right now? It's not comfortable. How is he using it to grow your faith? To shape you into someone? Not them. Stop trying to shape them. How is God shaping you? How, how is God using this illness right now? He's not causing the illness, but he's allowing it. How is he using it? to reform your character. Your greatest development as a person have always come on the other side of your greatest struggles, not your greatest comforts. And God knows that. And we have to trust him. We have to trust him. Second question on the test. Oftentimes, what God is doing is he is trying to get us to, to stop finding security in something other than him. And that's what God's doing in us. So here's the second question. Have you reordered your first love? Augustine wrote, he's a theologian in the 5th century, in the City of God, famous work. He said, but if the creator is truly loved, that is, he himself is loved and not something else in place of him, we must, however, observe right order even in our love. C.S. Lewis expounds on this idea of rightly ordered love. He says, To love as I should, to love you as I should, I must worship God as creator. When I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God instead of God, I shall be moving towards the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but increased. What's he saying? He's saying if you have not reordered your first love, which is some of what's going on when we're facing trials, first of all, you will not be able to love what is your first love to the fullest ability. It will never be, you'll never be able to love unless God is your first love. You'll never be able to love her like that unless God is your first love. You'll never be, have the marriage that you need to have unless God is your first love. 
You'll never be able to be the parent you need to be unless God is your first love. You'll never be able to be the friend you need to be unless God is your first love. Second, someday you're going to be tested. Me too. And what we're going to be tested in is what brings you the most joy and fulfillment. Is it God? Or is it something God gives? See, your chosen identity and security will always receive the most love in your life because it is your security. It is what you're counting on. One day, our bodies will break down and they will no longer, they will no longer work the way they're supposed to. Is work your identity? It's not going to last. One day, you might experience financial hardship. Is having money and being successful your identity? One day, you might lose someone. Or the marriage will end. Where is your identity? If God is not your first love, and if your identity is based on anything else, when you experience loss, do you know what's going to happen? It's going to crush you. Whenever you're unfaithful to your created identity that brings you value and worth, and whenever you're unfaithful to it, do you know what's going to happen? It's just going to devastate you. Don't you see? Our first love needs to be God. Because who is God's first love? It's you. You are the apple of his eye. You are what's on the mind of the greatest mind. How do we know this? Because he has proven his love for us in sacrificing his one and only son. He sacrificed his first love. He endured the pain of ultimate loss so that he might gain you and give you life and hope forever and ever and ever. He doesn't want to watch you base who you are on things that fall apart. He wants to give you security and identity and salvation and joy, even in the pain. How are you going to get that through genuine faith? What is genuine faith? Genuine faith, it believes, it receives, and it perceives God's proven love. God is the most trustworthy because he has loved the most. And you can base your whole life on him. When we look up close, do you have genuine faith? Is it based in God? Have you received mercy? Is his love your deepest basis for identity. Do you trust him most? Has he been ordered as your first love? Have you put your faith on him and said, yes, I want to follow you. I want you to be the foundation of my life. I confess my sin. I turn away from it. Maybe you need to do that today. We'll have some people back and the 103 to help you know what that next step is after that. Let me pray for you. Lord God, as we read the first part of Peter's letter, he starts with praise. He's praising because of the great mercy you have shown us and how that is a firm foundation. No matter the trial, no matter the struggle, who we are is who you called us to be and proved us to be through your great love on the cross in Jesus Christ. Just like the disciples, God, we say, help our unbelief. Help us to trust you and let it be observable. Help us to receive this new identity and put off these ones that don't work. And God, help us to perceive what's happening right now, even if it's hard, that you're using for your glory and our good. How deep your love is for us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Hey, would you stand? Let's sing.